As I mentioned, our study today has to do with the 400-year prophecy of Genesis chapter 15. Now, we need to go back to the very beginning in order to frame what we're going to study about today. The war for the control of human history began in the Garden of Eden, when Satan usurped the kingdom that God had given originally to Adam. But all was not lost. God warned Satan that he was going to send a seed to this world to do him battle and to recover the kingdom that Adam had forfeited. God gave this promise in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, where he predicted that he was going to send a seed to this world born of a woman, and this seed was going to do battle with Satan. In the process of the battle, the serpent was going to be successful in biting the heel of the seed of the woman. But then the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. You know, the image is of an individual who's walking down a path, and suddenly the head of a serpent, serpent comes forth and bites his heel. But then the person that was bitten raises his foot and crushes the head of the serpent. That's the imagery that we have in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. So in short, Adam forfeited his kingdom, Satan stole the kingdom, he usurped it, but God said, I'm going to send a seed to the world, he's going to do you battle, in the process you're going to hurt him, but he is going to crush your head. Now let's read the key verse in our study, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And we're going to find that there are five elements in this verse. Genesis 3 and verse 15. This is God's declaration of war on Satan, who has just taken Adam's kingdom from him. This is how it reads. God is speaking, and I will put enmity, that's the first element, God says, I will put enmity between you, here's the second element, the serpent, between you, the serpent, and the woman, here's the third element, the woman. So God is saying, I'm going to put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman. Now let's continue, and between your seed, that's element number four, the seed of the serpent, and her seed, that is the seed of the woman. And then God says, He, that is the woman's seed, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So there are five elements in this verse that we're going to pursue in our study today. First of all, we have a woman. In the second place, we have enmity. In the third place, there is a serpent. In the fourth place, the woman has a seed. And in the fifth place, the serpent has a seed. Genesis 3.15 was God's declaration of war on Satan. And Satan knew that if he lost that war, he would forfeit his kingdom, and not only his kingdom, but ultimately his very existence. Therefore, Satan made up his mind that he was going to prevent the fulfillment of the prophecy of Genesis 3.15. By every means at his disposal, he would attempt to counteract God's plan of bringing the seed into the world that would crush his head. And in the course of Old Testament history, Satan used two methods to try and prevent the seed from coming. The first method was by attempting to kill the seed. You see, Satan did not know at first that God was going to bring a series of women, typologically speaking, that would have seeds that ultimately from that line would come from a woman, the seed. 
Now let's notice in Genesis chapter 4 something very interesting. In Genesis chapter 4 <clears throat> Satan perhaps suspected that, that uh, Abel was going to be the promised seed, and so he made up his mind that he was going to get rid of Abel, the seed. Notice what we find in Genesis chapter 4, and let's read verse um, 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Of course, Cain had just killed his brother. Now it's interesting to notice that after Cain killed his brother, uh, God raised up another seed. In other words, God is raising up a lineage from which the Messiah ultimately will come. Notice this in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. That means appointed. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. So Satan thought, I got rid of Abel, who had a righteous character. And Cain, of course, was wicked. You find this in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 12. And so Satan, when he eliminates Abel, he says, mission accomplished. But God says, no, I will send another seed, Seth. And then comes another seed and another seed, preliminary seeds from which ultimately the seed will come. So Satan's first method to uh, impede the coming of the seed was to try and kill the preliminary seeds. He used a second method, and that was to corrupt the lineage from which the seed would come. We find an example of this in the story of the flood. We find that before the flood we're told that the sons of God, that is the lineage of the righteous, saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives from among the daughters of men, which is the lineage of the wicked. And as a result, the seed became corrupted. And the interesting thing is that between creation and the flood, you had 1,656 years. And at the time of the flood, there were only eight people that were still faithful to the Lord. That's amazing. Out of undoubtedly millions that were in the world, it had dwindled down to eight, a family of eight faithful people. In other words, Satan saw that he would be much more successful blending the seeds, having the righteous join together with the wicked, and as a result he hoped that he would eliminate the lineage from which the Messiah would come. So those are the two methods that Satan used to accomplish his purpose of keeping the promise of Genesis 3.15 from being fulfilled. Now let's move forward approximately 2,000 years in history after the fall. We're going to talk now about the time of Abram in the early patriarchal period. We find that God made three promises to Abram when He called him to leave Ur of the Chaldees. Those three promises were, number one, that his seed would inherit the land that God would show him. Two, that God would make him a great nation. And three, Abram would bring a blessing to all nations. Once again, his seed would inherit the land that God would show him. Two, God would make him a great nation, and three, Abram would bring a blessing to all nations. Let's read about this in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, and then we'll jump down to verse 7. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, and then verse 7. It says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, and from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, 
I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And then let's go to verse 7. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your seed I will give this land. Now several things that I want to emphasize in these verses. Notice that God told Abram to get out of his country, from his family, and from his father's house, to a land that God would show him. And then God promised that He would make Abraham a great nation, and that He would be a great blessing to all nations, and that in Him, that is in Abram, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And then God promised that His seed would inherit the land. Now, Abram knew that Isaac was not the promised seed. He also knew that the blessing was not going to come primarily through him, but the blessing would come through the seed, in capital letters, through Christ. He also knew that the promised land was not the little land of Canaan. He knew that the promised land included the entire world. Notice Romans chapter 4 and verse 13. Romans chapter 4 and verse 13. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Notice that God promised Abram that he was going to be the heir not only of the little land of Canaan, but of the world. Also, Abram knew very clearly that uh, the world that he was going to inherit was not ultimately even this world, but it was going to be the heavenly city, the New Jerusalem. Notice what we find in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, and I want to read verses 9 and 10. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Now notice this, verse 10. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's the New Jerusalem. In other words, he would inherit this earth when the New Jerusalem descends from heaven. He knew that the little land of Canaan was simply a miniature of something far greater. Notice also in Hebrews chapter 11 and verses 13 to 16. Speaking of the heroes that have been mentioned up to this point in the chapter, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. Now comes the key verse. But now they desire a better. That is a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. So Abram knew, first of all, that the land was not merely the land of Canaan. He knew that Isaac was not the promised seed. He understood that the land was the whole world. He understood that the seed was something far greater than Isaac. The seed was Jesus Christ. And he understood that the blessing would not come through him. The blessing would come through the promised seed, Jesus Christ. Notice that after Abraham on Mount Moriah was about to sacrifice his son, and God provided a substitute in place of His Son, we find that God gave a promise to Abraham, telling him that it was going to be through his seed that all nations would be blessed. You remember that in Genesis chapter 12, uh, God said to Abram that you shall be a blessing, speaking to Abraham. 
But Abraham knew that it was not he. He knew that it was through his seed that the blessing would come. And we'll see in a moment that the seed was not all of his descendants. It was one singular person. So after the Mount Moriah episode in Genesis chapter 2, uh, chapter 22 and verse 18, we find these words. This is the angel speaking to Abraham. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So notice God through the angel is telling Abraham, through your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed. God had said to Abraham, uh, uh, you shall be a blessing. But now the angel says, in your seed will come the blessing. Now, in order to fully understand this, we need to go to the writings of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul makes it very clear that the seed is none other than Jesus Christ. So let's go to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16, and take a look at this promise. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. So notice the Apostle Paul tells us that the seed was not all of the descendants of Abraham. The seed was one particular person. And he identifies that one particular person as Jesus Christ. By the way, Abraham understood this. Notice what we find in John chapter 8 and verse 56. John chapter 8 and verse 56. Here, Jesus is speaking to a group of Jews, and he says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So notice, uh, Jesus says, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. In other words, Abraham saw that I was going to come. I was the promised seed. And then Jesus says, and he saw it, and he was glad. We need to add also Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, where we find that the blessing does not come through Abraham. The blessing comes through the seed, Jesus Christ. Let's read those verses. Galatians 3, verses 13 and 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now let's stop there just for a moment. I need to uh, add a couple of clarifying notes here. It says here that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And so some people say, see the law is bad because the law curses us. Let's pursue this just for a moment. Why does the law curse us? The law curses us because we transgress the law. Let me give you an example from practical life. If you come to a corner where there's a stoplight and you decide to run through the red stoplight, the police officer, if he's around, is going to stop you and is going to give you a ticket. In other words, you are under the curse of the law. Is the law bad? Is the law that says that you're supposed to stop at a red light a bad law? Of course not. Imagine that there were no stoplights. There would be all kinds of crashes and people would be losing their lives. The problem is not with the stoplight. The problem is with the person who runs the stoplight. The person who runs the stoplight is under the curse of the law because that person has disobeyed the law. So we need to make, uh, make very sure that the law is not bad. It's the person who breaks the law that is the problem. So once again, Christ has redeemed us 
from the curse of the law. Now how did Jesus redeem us from the curse of the law? Notice what we find uh, in the following words, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. How did Jesus deliver us from the curse of the law? We're told that it was by becoming a curse. In other words, Jesus took all of our transgressions of the law upon Himself. He paid the debt that I owe, and therefore uh, the curse falls upon Jesus, it doesn't fall upon me. Now notice how the verse ends. Because Jesus took upon Himself the curse of the law, let me ask you, what is it that comes upon us? Well, you know, we were cursed, but Christ took our curse, so what is the result? Notice verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So notice, Jesus took the curse so that the blessing of Abraham could come upon us. So what have we found? The land that was promised to Abraham was not merely the little land of Canaan, it was the world. The world with the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem upon it, and by the way this is after the millennium, after the thousand years. The blessing does not come through Abraham, although he begins the process of establishing a lineage from which the seed will come, but the blessing comes through the seed. And the seed is not many, the seed is one. Now with this in mind, we need to go to the 400 year prophecy of um, Genesis chapter 15 and verses 13 through 16. In Genesis 15, 13 to 16, God gave Abram a 400 year prophecy telling him that his seed would dwell in a land that was not theirs for 400 years, and that they would become slaves in that land, but at the end of the 400 years, God would deliver them from slavery and return them to the land of Canaan. Now there's a very notable point, and that is that God did not identify the land that they would go to. God simply said that He would send them to a land that was not theirs. Of course their land was Canaan, so He was saying, I'm going to send them to a land other than the land of Canaan. Let's read Genesis 15 and verses 13 through 16. Genesis 15 and verses 13 through 16. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. I underline, God did not say where the land was. That's an important detail. So know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward, that means at the end of the four hundred years, afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So notice the, the scenario that we have here. God is saying that He's going to send His people to a nation that is not theirs, but does not identify which, uh, which nation it is. Then He says, when they're there they will be enslaved by that nation that is not theirs. And after the 400 years they shall come out of that land with great possessions and return to their land, in other words return to the land of Canaan. Now the key question is this, how could the prophecy of the 400 years 
in a land that is not theirs be fulfilled. If Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived in the land of Canaan and not in another land? Ah, the answer is Joseph. Although Joseph was spoiled by his father, he had a noble and holy character in contrast to his brothers who were conspirators and jealous and envious. Satan made up his mind that he was going to get rid of Joseph and influenced his brothers to sell him to Egypt. No doubt Satan had heard Joseph tell his dreams to his father and brothers, and so he decided to ship Joseph off to Egypt so that his dreams could not be fulfilled. Little did Satan realize that by transporting Joseph to a land not his, he was actually helping God fulfill the prophecy of the 400 years. God's providence continually intervened in the life of Joseph to make it possible for Jacob and his family to be transferred to Egypt. Let's notice a few of the details of the life of Joseph of how God is leading events to preserve the posterity from whom the Messiah will ultimately come. So let's review some of the events of the life of Joseph. God gave Joseph two dreams, the dream of the seven stalks of grain and the vision or the dream of the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowing to him. The fulfillment of his dreams seemed well nigh impossible because he had many older brothers. And so Satan, seeing that Joseph was a consecrated young man, said, I am not going to make it possible for his dreams to be fulfilled. And so he influenced the brothers of Joseph to sell him to the land of Egypt. And undoubtedly, when his brothers sold him to the land of Egypt, Satan was saying, good riddance, the dreams of Joseph are not going to be fulfilled. Joseph had no idea how his dreams were going to be fulfilled when he was taken as a slave to Egypt. However, we're told in Patriarchs and Prophets that he made up his mind that he was going to be faithful to God no matter what, that God had a providential plan and he was going to cooperate with God no matter what might happen. And so Joseph ended up, ended up in the house of Potiphar. And there's a reason for that. Joseph had to learn to be a good administrator because later on he was going to have to administrate all of the products of Egypt during the seven years of plenty and the seven years of famine. And Joseph became such a good administrator that Potiphar delegated everything to him except the food that was on the table. And so then Joseph, being faith, faithful in the home of Potiphar, runs into a snag. Satan influences Potiphar's wife to accuse Joseph of trying to violate her sexually, which landed Joseph into prison. Joseph might have thought, well, here, I'm faithful to God, I'm a faithful administrator in Potiphar's house, and what do I get as a result? I am cast into prison. What use is it to serve a God like this? But Joseph had made up his mind that he was going to go along with God's plan, even though he did not understand every stage. Why did Joseph end up in prison? The reason is very simple. He had to meet the cupbearer and the baker there in prison. Not only that, but Joseph became an even better administrator in the prison. In fact, he administrated everything so well, he kept things in order so well, that we're told that the jailer delegated the responsibility of caring for the prison 
uh, to Joseph. In other words, it's like Joseph became the jailer or, or the deputy of the jailer, if you please, because he was such a great and faithful administrator. So Joseph had to meet the cupbearer and the baker there in prison. That's why he ended up there in the providential plan of God. And so there in the prison, he met these two individuals, and God gave these two individuals, the baker and the cupbearer, dreams. And to make a long story short, the baker in three days was dead, was executed, and in three days the cupbearer was called once again to serve in Pharaoh's court. As the cupbearer was about to leave the prison, Joseph put in his ear, Could you please remember me when you come before Pharaoh? Put in a good word to see if I can get out of this place. So the cupbearer said, I will do that. Thank you so much for your dream, and I'm so happy that I'm able to go serve in Pharaoh's court once more. And how did the cupbearer reveal his gratitude? For two years, he totally forgot Joseph. Now, you might think, oh, he was so ungrateful. But really, the reason is that it was not yet time for the cupbearer to identify Joseph. The time would come two years later. What is it that happened? Well, two years later, God gave Pharaoh two dreams. And in these two dreams, God was telling Pharaoh that there was going to be seven years of plenty and seven years of famine, but Pharaoh did not understand the meaning of the dream. And so he called all the experts of the kingdom who supposedly uh, knew how to interpret dreams, and they said, we don't have the foggiest idea what your dreams mean. And so then God jogged the memory of the cupbearer because now was the time. And the cupbearer said, you know, there's this young man in prison, and then he told Pharaoh the story. And Pharaoh said, well, let's bring him to see if he's able to interpret the dreams. And so Joseph comes before Pharaoh, and he interprets Pharaoh's two dreams, telling him that there's going to be seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of severe famine. Now, Pharaoh had to find somebody to administrate the seven years of plenty and the seven years of famine, to store the products of the land for seven years of plenty and to uh, disperse the uh, products during the seven years of famine. And so the question was asked, you know, who could we find to administrate the goods of the land? Huh, and lo and behold, the cupbearer uh, had told Pharaoh that Joseph had interpreted his dreams. Pharaoh says, if Joseph is able to interpret my dreams, who better to administrate the products of Egypt than Joseph? Notice how God is guiding in this process. He is making it possible eventually for the Messiah to come, because it was Satan's purpose through the seven years of famine to eliminate the lineage from which the Messiah would come. We're going to see that a little bit later. So now Joseph, from a Hebrew prisoner, becomes the prime minister of Egypt. And I'm sure that Joseph at this point is saying, hmm, God is turning things around. God is guiding the events of history. Now the question is, what happened next? Well, there came the seven years of plenty, and Joseph, with his administrative skills imparted by God, he makes provision, he stores an abundance of goods, because he knew that seven years of famine were going to come. And the seven years of famine did come. You see, God had foreseen that Satan was going to cause this famine for seven years, and he made provision before, because Satan's purpose was to use the famine to obliterate God's faithful lineage from what's the seed, the Messiah, would come. And you say, how do you know that? Well, in order to understand this, we have to go to Genesis chapter 45 and verses 5 through 8. You see, Satan has a hidden agenda. 
what we see in visible history is only a small fraction of what is taking place behind the scenes. Satan has to guess what God is going to do, but God already knows everything that Satan is going to do in history, and therefore God can take measures to counteract the actions of Satan. Notice Genesis chapter 45 and verses 5 through 8. Joseph eventually uh, identifies himself to his brothers. His brothers begin crying. They say, oh, Joseph, we're so sorry that we sold you. Please forgive us. You know, at first they're kind of scared that he's going to take uh, vengeance over them, but he doesn't. He actually embraces them with tears in his eyes. And so now Joseph speaks to his brothers. And by the way, his dreams were literally fulfilled because his brothers came and bowed before him just like Joseph had seen in his dreams. So notice Genesis chapter 45 and verse 5. But now, Joseph says to his brothers, Do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. Now notice, three times we're going to find the same thought. For God sent me before you to preserve life. So why did Joseph end up in Egypt? He says, God sent me here. Now there were lots of detours. Because Satan, God knew how Satan was going to work. God knew that Potiphar's wife was going to accuse Joseph. And so God uh, leads in the events to make sure that all events end up the way that he has established. Verse 6, For these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. Now the second time. And God sent me before you, what reason? To preserve a posterity for you in the earth, and save your lives by a great deliverance. Satan's attempt was to starve the lineage from which the seed would come. And then, notice verse 7 again, And God sent me before you to preserve a, posper a posterity for you in the earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now, it was not you, third time, it was not you who sent me here, but God. Three times Joseph said, God sent me here, because he knew what Satan was going to do. And so then he says uh, in verse 8, So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me, notice God has made me, a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, what happened during the famine? Well, bottom line, during the famine, it got so bad after a couple of years in the land of Canaan, that Jacob said to his sons, you have to go to Egypt because I've heard that there are provisions in Egypt, that they have a reserve of grain there. So you have to go because if you don't, we are all going to die of starvation. And so, you know the story, I'm not going to tell you the entire story. The sons of Jacob, with the exception of Benjamin, go to Egypt to, to procure provisions so that they don't starve to death in, death in the land of Canaan. And you have the plot of the story, uh, which I'm not going to tell, where uh, Joseph provides uh, sustenance for them so that the lineage from which the Messiah will come will not disappear from the earth. And then you know what the result was. Joseph ultimately said to his brothers, you know, there's still five years of famine. And so go to your father and tell him to transfer over to Egypt. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, the, the family of Jacob, all the sons, transferred to the land of Egypt to a land not theirs, according to the prophecy. Now Satan is understanding that maybe he blew it. Because God had said in the prophecy of the 400 years that they were going to go to a land not theirs. 
he undoubtedly did not suspect that by shipping Joseph off to the land of Egypt, uh, the prophecy of the 400 years was going to be fulfilled. Now Satan says, "Uh oh, I've got a problem. And so Jacob and his family go to the land of Egypt by the way they tended sheep, and the Egyptians despised those who tended sheep. So they ended up in the land of Goshen, interestingly enough, a very fertile land separated from the Egyptians. Now the question is this, why didn't God simply lead, lead leave Jacob and his family in the promised land. Why ship them off to Egypt and then ship them back to the promised land? I want to read a passage here from uh, the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 232, on the reason why God shipped Jacob and his family to Egypt for 400 years, then to return to the land of Canaan. Here is the statement. The assurance, fear not to go down into Egypt, God is speaking here, for I will there make of thee a great nation, was significant. The promise had been given to Abraham of a posterity numberless as the stars, but as yet the chosen people had increased but slowly. And the land of Canaan now offered no field for the development of such a nation as had been foretold. It was in the possession of powerful heathen tribes that were not to be dispossessed until the fourth generation. If the descendants of Israel were here to become a numerous people, in other words in Canaan, they must either drive out the inhabitants of the land or disperse themselves among them. The former according to the divine arrangement, they could not do. And should they mingle with the Canaanites, they would be in danger of being seduced into idolatry. Egypt, however, offered the conditions necessary to the fulfillment of the divine purpose. A section of the country, well watered and fertile, was open to them. There, affording every advantage for their speedy increase. And the antipathy they must encounter in Egypt on account of their occupation, for every shepherd was an abomination unto the Egyptians, would enable them to remain a distinct and separate people and would thus serve to shut them out from participation in the idolatry of Egypt. Satan was undoubtedly taking note of what God was doing. Too late, it dawned on him that God had transplanted Joseph and his family from Canaan to a land not theirs. With the passing of time, Jacob's descendants grew into a great nation in Goshen, where they were isolated to a great degree from the idolatrous practices of the Egyptians. So God said, you can't remain in Canaan, because if you remain in Canaan, you have to expel these powerful nations, and if you disperse among them, you're going to become like them. You're going to lose your identity. So God says, I'm going to transport you to Egypt, and I'm using Joseph as the way to make that possible. In Egypt, you'll end up in the land of Goshen, a very fertile land, very propitious for the growing the nation that I promised. And because you'll be in Goshen and the Egyptians despise shepherds, you'll remain somewhat separate from the idolatrous practices of the Egyptians. They did not remain totally separate, but they did not totally lose their identity as God's chosen people either. So notice how God is acting providentially in history to make sure that the Messiah, the seed that was promised, could come to the world. You see, I like to compare history, and I mentioned this in previous presentations, I like to look at history like a game of chess. Now I don't play chess. Uh, you know, I have a mind where everything has to move forward. 
you know, I like to play checkers because in checkers you move forward. In chess, you know, you can move sideways too. It becomes very, very complicated. And chess is a very intellectually challenging game. But I like to compare the movements of history with the movements of a chess game. Now on one side of the table is seated God, and on the other side of the table is seated Satan. And the movements of the, uh, of the pawns or the pieces on the board represent the movements of history. So what God says, you know on one side of the table He says to Satan, okay, uh, your turn to play. And so Satan plays. And then God uh, says, okay, now it's my turn. So God plays and He frustrates the move of Satan. And Satan says, oh, I, I wish that I knew that God was going to do that. I would have moved differently. But now uh, Satan finds a way in which he can move where he thinks that he's going to defeat God. He says, okay, now it's your move. So God says, okay, it's my move now. And so God moves to counteract the move of Satan. And so moves history back and forth, back and forth. Ellen White speaks of the play and counterplay of history. Now let me ask you this, what would happen if you played a game of chess where you knew before the game started all of the moves that the other player was going to make? Is there any chance that you could lose the game of chess if you already knew all of the moves that the other player was going to make? there would be no chance of losing because you could counteract all the moves of the other. Now in the game of chess, <laughs> symbolic chess if you please, God already knows before the game starts all of the moves in history that Satan is going to make because God knows the end from the beginning according to Isaiah 46 and verses 9 through 11. God already knew everything that Satan was going to do uh, with Joseph's brothers, and Joseph ended up in prison, and so on. Every single one of those events God knew beforehand. And so God could work to counteract the movements of Satan by giving dreams to Joseph, and by giving dreams to Pharaoh, and by giving dreams to the baker and to the cupbearer, because God already knew all of the moves that Satan was going to make. You see, in the game of history, a very serious game by the way, in the game of history, God knows all of the moves that Satan is going to make, but Satan has to guess how God is going to move. And when you have to guess how God is going to move, you are prone to make mistakes. That's why God said, I'm going to send your family, your descendants to a land that is not theirs and they will be there 400 years. Little did Satan suspect that by convincing the brothers of Joseph to sell him to Egypt, he was actually cooperating with God to fulfill the prophecy of the 400 years. This is the way that we need to look at history. There is a conspiracy behind history. And the conspiracy is Satan trying to counteract the movements of God. Now, let's introduce what we're going to study in our next presentation. You see, this is actually a series of probably three presentations. Satan now understood that God's plans know no haste and no delay. And so Satan now says, I have to counteract what God is doing. It was now Satan's turn to counterplay the moves that God made. Therefore, Satan influenced the Egyptians with all his cunning and strength to enslave the Israelites, to keep them in the land that was not theirs. Satan knew that the 400 years were about to end and that God was planning to take His people back to Canaan. Now here's the interesting thing. Satan's hidden cruelty was manifested visibly in the hard-heartedness of Pharaoh. As Satan's seed, Pharaoh did his utmost to keep Israel in bondage in Egypt. 
time and again in the early chapters of Exodus, God said to Pharaoh, let my people go, to which Pharaoh responded with even harsher measures each time. Satan knew that the seed would be born in the land of Canaan, and he was going to do his utmost to keep Israel in Egypt. So now Satan says, okay, God, you brought your people down into Egypt so that they could become a great nation, so that they could grow, so that they would be somewhat isolated from idolatry, but now I am going to take every measure possible to keep your people from going back to the land of Canaan where the Messiah will be born. And so the hatred of Pharaoh becomes great, but Pharaoh is only the emissary of Satan. In fact, we're going to find in Ezekiel 29 and verse 3 that Pharaoh is called the great dragon. Now we know that the great dragon is Satan, but the dragon's dragon, if you please, is Pharaoh. In this case, it's a civil ruler that Satan influences to keep God's people in bondage. Let's read Exodus chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 as we bring our study to a close today. Exodus 5 verses 1 and 2, which manifests the hatred of Pharaoh against God's people because he's instigated by Satan. He cannot allow the people to go back to the land of Canaan because that is where the seed will be born that will crush his head. It says in Exodus 5, 1 and 2, Afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. By the way, we are told 15 times in Exodus that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Let me ask you, who hardened Pharaoh's heart? Well, we know that ultimately he hardened his own heart, but the person who actually influenced him to harden his heart was the influence of Satan. I hope that we're understanding now that behind history, behind visible history, there is an invisible battle between Christ and Satan for the dominion of the world. God had promised a seed that would crush Satan's head, and Satan said, if I allow this seed to come, I am doomed. I'm going to lose my kingdom, and I'm going to lose my very existence, and therefore Satan takes every measure to uh, counteract the plan of God, but God cannot fail, because God already knows before even the creation of this world, in eternity past, all of the moves that Satan was going to make in the course of history. God cannot lose. So if we ally ourselves with God, there's no way that we can lose. We can also be winners if we ally ourselves with the winner in the course of human history. I trust that as we've studied this today, the first part of this series, that you will praise the Lord for being in absolute control of the events of history. And by the way, He'll have no problem in controlling and directing our lives if we commit them to Him. May that be our experience. The golden morning is fast approaching, and Jesus soon will come. Let's sing number 205, Gleams of the Golden Morning. 
Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for the way in which you have guided in human history. We thank you that you are in control of everything. When things seem to be spinning out of control, we know that you are seated on your throne in heaven. You have everything calculated, everything planned, and your plan will ultimately succeed. We thank you, Lord, for being such a wonderful God for having everything under control. We ask that you will come and you will control our lives by our consent. We pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm. 